So one question that has often popped into my mind is what will computers evolve into? Like the evolution of humans, which is still ongoing, computers are also in an evolutionary process, which shows no sign of slowing down. Many of you will have seen pictures of early computer systems, from the analytical engine designed by Charles Babbage to those very early code-breaking computers at Bletchley Park. They are all, quite literally, binary dinosaurs, exceptionally large, heavy and slow-moving. Looking back on those early machines and comparing them to the computers we have now, it is easy to see the trend for smaller, faster and more powerful computing devices. But in what direction will future computing devices go? How will the trend look if we project it forwards? It is tempting to look at the size of computers as the single significant trend, like looking at the size of dinosaurs. But there are multiple trends in the evolution of both dinosaurs and computers. The trends are more nuanced. Yes, computers have become much smaller, but they also use significantly less power and can access vastly more storage than they used to. So the first aspect to trend is the number of computers that appeared in people's homes. If we look at a home computer kit that was available at the end of the 1970s and compare it to what you can buy for the same sort of price today, today's computer could have a million times more memory, two million times as much storage and have a clock speed at least 1,000 times as fast. But all of this did not come about overnight, but rather through many innovations and improvements during the last 40 to 50 years. Early home computer kits were initially only of interest to hobbyists, as there was little or no software ready available to run on them. Additionally, of the many different home computers that were launched over those next few years, they were all incompatible with each other. Different processors, different operating systems, different hardware and storage solutions. All that started to change with the launch of the IBM PC in 1981 and the move to rationalise the hardware standards began. Not that rationalisation was IBM's plan, but a number of other companies started to look to create compatible computers that would either match the hardware but for a lower price, or exceed the hardware specification for the same price. IBM sold around 7.4 million PCs of various models between 1981 and 1987, and exceeded expectations. So what drove the rapid uptake of home computers? What was the next stage in their evolution? Connectivity and the World Wide Web. While networks did exist in the early 90s, it wasn't until August the 6th, 1991, that Tim Berners-Lee created the first website at CERN and brought about the rise of the World Wide Web. By 1984, the World Wide Web was accessible to the general public and the first browsers were available. The number of websites, then around 2,700, began an exponential growth. 1995 saw 23,500 websites online, and by 1996 it had reached more than a quarter of a million. In 1998, Google was founded and eventually came to dominate the search engines. The age of the online home computer had arrived and every home computer launched thereafter had either a built-in modem or the ability to connect to one. The next step in the evolution of the home computer was broadband internet access, introduced in the UK in the year 2000. This provided much faster connection speeds and made it a lot easier to browse the internet and both download and send files. Connection speeds would continue to increase 
in the years that followed. But the content of websites would also evolve, with web pages containing ever more graphics and becoming interactive. Gradually, computers and their operating systems evolved from being able to go online to be always being online. So what was the next evolutionary step? Mobile computing. Computers have evolved from huge machines to the size of laptops and tablets, and we now enter the age of mobile computing, where you can carry your computer with you. To cement this came the rise of the smartphone, itself evolved from what was referred to as a mobile or cell phone. The smartphone is now a device that has a very much secondary function of telephony. Most of the time, users don't use their smartphone to make regular phone calls. They will rather use an app or application installed on the smartphone to communicate. Over time, it's likely that the smartphone will lose the ability to make regular phone calls and everything will be done via an app. The smartphone is very much a computer now, with a multi-core processor, memory, storage, camera and the ability to run multiple applications at the same time. So this is where we are now. What can we project forward? What is the trend for this continued evolution? The general public have long been described as consumers of manufactured goods. Smartphones and computers are now the interface by which they are consumers of data. If we look at the growth of smartphones since 2014, we can see that the user base has grown fourfold in the last 10 years. All this even though smartphones have limited screen sizes and a poorer keyboard interface. Notwithstanding these limitations, smartphones are overwhelmingly the preferred device for most people to access the internet. Probably because of portability, the device never leaves your side. There are of course still a large number of computer users accessing the internet, especially those creating content for those on smartphones. But the trend towards the preference for small, portable computers, or what we refer to as smartphones, is undeniable. The infrastructure underpinning the smartphone has been fundamental to the rise of the smartphone as a global phenomenon. While smartphones have limited range, the saturation of population centres with cell towers, allowing the illusion of global connectivity, with faster and faster access speeds has been central to their widespread adoption. Add in the improved performance of these phones and it's hard to argue that such computing devices will not continue to proliferate, despite the increasing costs for the top of the range models. At the moment, messaging, listening to music and video consumption are among the most popular activities in the world of smartphones. So if we are entering an age where the smartphone dominates, what comes next? Let's consider the smartphone as an interface to everything in the online world. You connect with that interface via touch, speech, vision and audio. Smart watches have been out for some time allowing an interface to the phone, albeit a limited one. Bluetooth earpods with speakers and microphones have also been out for a while. What is to stop all the functionality of the phone being put into something like a smartwatch, perhaps with a larger screen? Would this be a likely evolution of the phone? Like the evolution of birds, with the smartphone it's all about weight and power. Smartphones are now multi-processing core devices. However, these take more power, leading to bigger batteries. But people don't want to carry around huge battery packs or be tied to an external power brick. So phones do every trick to minimise their power usage, 
blanking the screen, a major use of power after just a few seconds, unless you're watching a video. Automatic watches work by converting the natural movement of the wearer's wrist into energy to wind the mainspring, which then powers the watch. Could such an approach be used to help extend the power of a smartwatch? Will new battery technology cram even more energy into ever smaller batteries? Will the move to ever more power efficient processors continue unabated? Power is a major obstacle in smartphone design. But could existing wireless charging technologies be extended to seamlessly charge your phone without you having to plug the phone in? Just walk into a shop or mall and wall-mounted charging ports will charge your phone without you having to lift a finger. Of course, there is likely to be a cost for this, perhaps added to your monthly bill. The small screen on smartwatches would be detrimental to watching videos. But could contact lenses be the ultimate display screen? There are companies that are already working on this technology. Smart glasses have already been tried and didn't take off in the market. So would contact lenses have a similar problem? After all, not everyone likes or would want to wear contact lenses. There are smartphones available now with folding screens, allowing the increase in screen real estate without having a larger device. Could these be a harbinger of what is to come? Display projection is another technology that has come on in leaps and bounds, giving any flat surface the ability to become your screen. Or will the smartphone shrink to become a part of the clothes you wear, or perhaps be included in a set of trendy sunglasses? The future of computers, both those we carry with us and those that sit on desks, is not only bright, it's dazzling and very likely to be less about the hardware and more about convenience and content. But that's it for today. Thank you for watching.